my job is to talk about the Union Bank journey and why we're engaging with fintechs. And whenever we do our strat plan, this is our mantra. The future does not come from the present. Rather, the present comes from the future. So the first thing we need to do, obviously, is to imagine what the future might be. And the core of any future for us is who we are, why we do what we do, and for whom we do what we do. And the what, how follows. And the anchor is the customer. And in the future of a token economy, distributed ledger technologies, we see the role of Union Bank as being principally, our main product is trust. And we're gonna get out of the manufacturing business, doing products and services, which customers sometimes want, sometimes they don't, and giving the customer choice. So in the future, we imagine that we will be a gateway of curated products and services to marketplaces, lending marketplaces, investment marketplaces, foreign exchange marketplaces, to wallets, which are your operating uh, expenses, to development tools, which allows each customer, enterprise grade or individual, to begin through today, using API platforms, to begin to connect to us directly in a sandbox and operationalize their ideas. And uh, obviously identity, etc. So this is the future we're imagining for now. This might change in the next strat plan. And why? What, are the, what drives us to imagine this future? So we're seeing two big mega trends. So the first one is the idea of the collaborative commons. So what do we see today? Op the European Union is a collaborative common. The open source code is a collaborative common. The sharing economy, Uber, Airbnb, Grab, those are collaborative commons. And um, Facebook and a, a lot of this, YouTube, these are collaborative commons. But if you took an economics class in the 70s, like I did, they talked about the tragedy of the commons. Now the, common, the, the commons is very important because we have an epigenetic marker as humans because that was our first economic system where pastures were shared, fisheries were shared, forests were shared, farmlands were shared in villages of 150 uh, people. That was the most we could do interacting face to face. This lady, Eleanor Ostrom, won the Nobel Prize in 2009 by debunking that idea and making, through her studies, eight rules that could make a collaborative commons work. Now, collaborative commons have a problem, and that problem is scale. So what I described was today, for example, a condominium corporation is an example of a collaborative common. All these associations that we have, FinTech, BAP, et cetera, are a form of collaborative commons. But as you can imagine, they're not scalable. They're face-to-face -face collaborative commons. Technology has changed that. So the examples that I described today now allow us to go back to our origins and scale it. And there are a lot of signs visible that the capitalist system, the socialist system, and before that, the feudal and mercantilist systems need to be complemented by this original system, today scalable through technology. <coughs> There's another thing happening. Customers are very spoiled. The customer experience, the choice, of products and services, the available price points that are given to you by technology companies, by Amazon, by Netflix, by Airbnb, and all of these people 
make the customer now expect from traditional businesses like ourselves a higher level of customer service, a higher level of choice. And with the development tools that are now available to customers, even the possibility that a customer, an individual customer, can on their phone app with a bank profile their own products and services. So it's not about technology for us. Technology is available, it can be bought. There are use cases that need to be developed as we emerge. It still boils down to the essence of who we are, why we do it, what we do, and for whom we do it. And that's the customer. So because of these two mega trends, we feel that that idea of the future that we imagine is a possible future. And how do we respond to that? So here comes Cesar's symbiotic convergence. So I said, do we look at fintechs and technologies, companies as threats? To some extent, yes. Are they competitors? Definitely. But is one, gonna, is one of these institutions gonna become dinosaurs? Probably not. I think when we look at what they have as advantages, we all have our advantages. I cannot imagine Amazon getting a banking license, for example. Their PE multiple will go down from 40 to 7. And Jeff Bezos will go from one half of what he had after the divorce to maybe one fifth, uh, one tenth of one half, right? So clearly, scalability, regulatory, uh, balance sheet, and trust, trust is what we offer to the thing. So I just have a list here of basically why we believe that symbiotic convergence is an option over time. It may not start right away, it's beginning days, so this is what's happening. And what do we need to do? So on both sides of that symbiotic convergent chart, you've got the technology companies, and you've got the fintechs, and in the middle is a traditional bank. We're different species. And for convergence to co occur, to procreate an alternative business model in the future, we need to be the same species. And we've redefined ourselves in Union Bank as a technology company, also a bank, and have undertaken eight years ago the beginning of a transformation journey that we expect to end by 2020. And it's anchored on these elements that I have on the chart. We have culture, strategy, space, physical to virtual space to platforms and ecosystems, processes, using different technologies, cloud, robotic process automation, AI, and of course, the most important, which I'll talk to you about now, API platform, where we share an open API platform, and uh, blockchain, and in the future, IoT, data science, quantum computing, and AI, coming together to be able to now produce for the customer what they really want. Not only a customer experience, but they also want contextual and cogni cognitive insighting. They want us to be able to predict their needs before they even know that they need it. And this requires us to move into that world. Of course, people, you know, every, every time we talk about, oh, this is gonna replace people, I don't think so we'll have to unlearn a lot of things that we learn, including us at the very top of the organization, learn new things and continue learning, and there are gonna be new jobs that are gonna be available. And so we're working that. And the last piece is collaboration. How is any organization gonna cope with the diversity, the variety of technologies that are developing 
the effort to change behavior so that they're adapted and to discover that is going to be a real challenge. So the end goal of our transformation is this, a culture that's values-based and purpose-led rather than compliant, an organization and team members that are agile, and we're working on that, customers with whom we co-create products and services using development tools, obviously not one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, space that's both physical and virtual, platforms and ecosystem, a strategy that is so, uh, so impossible to obtain, a moonshot, that you need to rethink everything that you do. When the basic hygiene in a fourth industrial age economy is 24-7, Six Sigma reliability, T plus zero real-time transactions, safe and secure and cheap, how do you handle that when you have five million customers? Maybe the current systems can deal that, but how do you handle that when you have 50 million customers or 100 million customers? Co-creating with each one of these, it's impossible. So that's an important part of the strategy, not the specifics, but the impossibility of it makes you th have to rethink how you do things and how you even think. Competitors, coopetitors, I call them, symbiotic convergence, and of course the process are enabling technologies. Now how do we work this? So we have a funnel when we deal with fintechs. And part of the funnel is, to be frank, risk mitigation. Because when you're dealing with a lot of innovation, the risk of failure is very high. Not necessarily the technology itself, but the adoption by customers and by the marketplace. Capital, we don't want to risk our capital up front. We need to discover. And there's a lot of capital flowing into fintechs, and hopefully, as they discover what works, it's on their balance sheet. And third is regulatory. A lot of innovations are difficult for us to get through the regulator because we're a systemically important bank. So even though it's a very small thing, sounds innocuous, the reality is we get a more, I guess, enhanced due diligence whenever we make a product offering request. But the fintechs seem to have regulatory right and get things done easier. And that becomes for us an opportunity to work with them or in some instances point it out to the regulator as something we also can do. If you gave it to them, you should be able to give it to us. And finally, we synergize, and when we really know that we uh, work, we invest and possibly even bring them into the fold. The last part, the bring them into our product, is really difficult, and I go back to that idea that we need to transform ourselves. One of my good friends is Matthias Kroner, who is the founder of Fidor Bank, which is one of the biggest sort of digital only banks and I saw him in November in Singapore and I said, why don't you come to the Philippines? I think it's ripe to set up a digital only bank and we don't want to reinvent the world. And he said, Tito, give me time until April or May because I'm getting a divorce. I said, what do you mean you're getting a divorce? Oh, I sold my bank to a French bank, mainstream bank, and we've been working on it for a few years and <laughs> It's just not happening. My vision, my value system, my culture, my passion for making a difference is not happening. So I need to get it out and start all over again. So this is very important for us. You know, can we graduate? So API platforms right now, so getting back to some nitty gritty, is the main event that we used today with many of the fintechs that are connected to us, we have 836 APIs, 128 of them are open, are exposed, and we get 266,000 average daily calls. 
And so we are able now to interact with fintechs in a very seamless way, very cost-effective way, and be able to test their actual uh, proposition live, not a concept, not a white paper, and this is very helpful. So this is where we are today. Uh, we have about 100 engagements with fintechs. Some we just bank, some we enable, some we are beginning to partner with and synergize with, uh, you know, home credit being one of them, first circle, uh, true money, etc. And we're now, finally, we got an approval from the Banco Central to put up a corporate venture capital vehicle so that we can begin to invest as the last stage before we actually believe that integration becomes an option, right? We also are the pilot bank for the Philippines when the APIX platform, which is an ASEAN-wide um, API platform sponsored by the Monetary Authority of Singapore. As you can see, we tested, uh, this was launched in November by Prime Minister Modi. You have uh, Sopnendo Mohanty of the MAS who was with us yesterday in the Milken Institute. Uh, Paul Gui, who is the ASEAN Banking Council head and the Vice Deputy Prime Minister of Singapore. So what this does is allow fintechs to connect one time to APEX and immediately they become connected to all the banks that have APIs connected to APEX throughout ASEAN. Well, actually it includes India. So you don't have to go one-on-one, -on -one, bank to bank. You just go one time to APEX and boom, you're connected to everyone. Of course, sandbox, you know, you know the routine. So are there advantages for us? Of course, it gives us broader access to customers we wouldn't even touch. Lending customers that we have in our books, but we don't lend them money because they're too small or we don't have the data or it's too inconvenient to be doing all these paper-based uh, uh, assessments rather than using alternative credit scoring and this. So these are it gives us, it helps us learn and it helps us imagine what the customer experience is. And we know that customers keep raising the bar. You know, when they're happy with this, tomorrow it gets this and so forth. So this continuous raising of the bar is something that the mainstream company with all our processes and procedures have difficulty doing especially in a very highly regulated, compliant-based culture, right? So this is what we get from the fintechs, and of course, an expansion of our product offering. I got some fintechs to tell me what they think or what matters to them, and you know, so one guy says, uh, oh, open-mindedness. So we as an institution, as part of this culture building, so we're talking to them, how, how can we do better? He says, well, we like your open-mindedness, your spirit of experimentation, your willingness not to close the door on day one, but to see in a sandbox what can happen. And finally, whether there's actually customer adoption or not. Mint basically said APIs, so apparently that seems strange, but for us, we even host other companies in our API platform uh, so that they can publish their own APIs. And uh, others talk about how we partner as a startup, how we can help them, not with money necessarily, but clearly with access to a customer base, access to a, a, a payment system. So that's enable, the second step in our funnel. And um, you know, it's basically walking the talk. So, you know, when you listen to all these uh, comments, you, you can understand or you can appreciate why technology is not the centerpiece of it all. It's about open-mindedness, experimentation, walk the talk, you know, things like that. What's your purpose? Do you have a purpose? 
how do you engage your customer base to do that purpose? And I think that's the thing. And obviously, we also help the customers of our fintech partners, principally on the lending space, because we have a balance sheet and uh, most don't have. So I think that's the end of my sort of presentation. It gives you a kind of a sort of a bird's eye view of why we're in this path to achieve that vision of the future that I showed where finally the customer will have self-sovereign IDs and the customer will be able to produce products and services that are personalized so that the holy grail of market segment of one can finally be achieved and where we begin to allow customers, both individuals and enterprise, to chart their own destiny. Thanks. Thanks.